So welcome everybody, um, all you folks that are on Zoom as well as on Facebook is loading up. And my name is Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I appreciate you guys joining us here tonight. We're talking about our title. I have to read it because it's kind of long. <laughs> Selling local flowers when global wholesale supply is disrupted. So this is truly a breaking news situation changing. Um, and I'm just so happy that Ellen and Dave were able to join me here tonight. So we kind of have all sides of the industry kind of covered here. And um, so if you guys have never met us before, um, I'm the owner of the gardenersworkshop.com. I was, I've been a flower farmer for 23 years and do a whole lot of other things now. Um, and then I am joined here with my good friend, Ellen Frost. And Ellen is our go-to expert on local sourcing as a florist and a designer. She actually owns a design studio in Baltimore that only uses product that's grown within 100 miles of her shop. And yes, her shop is open year round. And the name, it's Local Color Flowers. And we'll talk more about how we can connect with her um, throughout the program here tonight. Um, and we're joined by our bestie, Dave Dowling. Um, Dave is a veteran flower farmer. He farmed for 20 years before he moved up the food chain, as I think <laughs> of him. Um, and he went on to become a sales rep with Edney Bulb Company, which then turned into Fred Glockner, which now is part of Ball Hort. And that's where he works. So he is our go-to guy for seeds, bulbs, plugs, just everything we need. I mean, he's just such a gift to the industry to be able to call up and say, Dave, what dahlias do I want to grow or what, you know, anyway. So that's who we have here tonight. And the number one thing you can do to help us for doing this is to like and share this broadcast, to share it on your um, feed for your flower farming friends, your florist friends, your designer friends to see, because we feel like we have a lot of great information, encouragement, and hope of how we can all come together to close this gap between farmers, florists, and designers. And it's going to be a bumpy road. I have goosebumps even saying this, y'all. It is going to be a bumpy road, yes. but we can do it, you know, and I think a lot of good can come out of this. And it's already hair crazy for some people. <laughs> We're hearing some really crazy stories. Um, so with that, I would like to ask Ellen if she would kind of bring us, just imagine that we have people on here that don't even know what we're talking about. Sure. So I want you to kind of paint the picture of what is actually happening in the industry. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ellen Frost. Like Lisa said, I'm the owner of Local Color Flowers, a floral design studio in Baltimore, Maryland. And I'll tell you up front that we do source all of our flowers locally. We buy direct from about 30 farms in our region. And we are not really buying flowers from the wholesale market. Um, however, we have good relationships with a lot of wholesalers in our region. We do buy, still buy hard goods um, from the wholesalers. And so um, I wanna just say that up front that um, in the last week or so, this is how this got started, maybe the last week and a half, we started getting emails um, from our wholesalers, um, from a number of wholesalers that we have accounts with. And the gist of the emails was that uh, flower supply was very low, prices were going up and were very high, and that florists buying from the wholesalers should expect um, that there were going to be um, sort of disruptions in supply and that florists should um, figure out how to substitute for things that they maybe normally use or have planned for weddings. Um, and so every day I was getting these emails and I knew, you know, it didn't sound good. And we had already had a lot of problems from COVID starting last March, which I can get into. Um, but it wasn't really until I got a email from a wholesaler just a couple of days ago, and this is when I reached out to Lisa and Dave, um, that really caught my attention because this wholesaler was saying, um, we are not going to be able to take any pre-orders for weddings or events 
for the foreseeable future. And that florists should be just buying from the regular list the week of the wedding um, without any expectation that they can pre-order or any expectation that they're gonna get exactly what they hoped for. Um, and so, you know, as a, as a wedding florist, as an event florist, um, bells went off in my head because as a florist, one of the benefits of buying from a wholesaler, if you're a conventional florist and you're buying from a wholesaler, one of the benefits is that you can order in advance. One of the things that florists complain about or say is a hurdle to sourcing locally is that you may not know what's available until the week of your event or 10 days before your event. And now the wholesaler was telling florists this exact situation was happening. And so I knew um, it was bad, but then that made it seem like extra bad to me. Um, and so I really wanted to reach out to Lisa and Dave, but also I wanted to help sort of educate our community about what is happening in the global sort of trade and supply chain and then figure out what, how we can prepare farmers, our, our flower farmers for this situation, how we can support florists who may be um, panicking and searching out new suppliers, and then how to help support, I mean, frankly, florists like me who have been sourcing locally for a long time and now are gonna see, like I think pretty intense competition for flowers going mm -hmm. forward. Um, so there's a lot of levels of sort of panic <laughs> in this situation from low level to high level. Um, and I just thought it would be good if we could have sort of an open conversation about what was going on and how to strategize on how we can all sort of get through this. So I can give you a little bit of background just on what is happening and why it's happening. Um, so supply, let's talk first about supply. So this really started, I mean, it, there's a lot of issues that go into this and really you could say it goes back even further, but let's start with COVID last year, you know, starting in March, we were seeing, you know, all over the internet, all over um, floral news, you know, the Dutch markets throwing out, you know, gobs and gobs of flowers that the Dutch farmers were throwing away fields of flowers. The South American growers were throwing away fields of flowers. And basically this was because everything shut down. Events shut down, air transport shut down. Um, people were not allowed to go to work. There were quarantines. There was all, it, it, basically the industry stopped in March. And March is not a good time for the flower industry to stop because this is get moving into Easter. It's Mother's Day, it's the start of wedding season. There were all kinds of things that flower farmers and flower wholesalers were preparing for and basically everything shut down. And frankly, a lot of these farmers and a lot of these wholesalers lost a ton of money. So much so that a lot went out of business, a lot decided to not plant for the coming season or to plant um, much more um, conservatively because they were afraid they weren't really sure what was going to happen in the coming season. And so we're starting to see some of the repercussions of those farms going out of business and those farms being a little bit, bit more, um, a, little, a little nervous about growing a lot of stuff that they may not be able to sell. So that's and, more- And so we're starting to see Ooh. some of the repercussions of those farms Dave, mute. Dave, why don't you mute? <laughs> I didn't mean to do Sorry. Um, all right. So another issue with supply um, is that there have been really horrible, horrible storms in Central and South America in these last few weeks and even into like, you know, eight weeks, 10 weeks, so much so that entire crops have been destroyed. Um, so we've had, we have some European issues because right now you also know that Europe is under lockdown again. So places like Holland who depend on a lot of Polish workers. People can't travel across the border. They can't go back and forth to work. So we have European issues. We also have Central and South American issues. Um, we also have a lot of logistical problems. So there have been supply chains. I mean, look at the 
Suez Canal, right? There's like, I guess the boat's free now, but you know, we already were having supply chain issues um, with logistics. And so, you know, planes have been shut down. There are, um, I don't know how many, how many of you know this, but most of the flowers that are being transported into the United States are, are shipped in the body of passenger planes. And so people do use freight planes, but those are for really large farms and in really large situations like Valentine's Day and Mother's Day. But on most of the time, those flowers are coming in the body of passenger planes. And do you know who is not flying right now? Everybody. There are hardly any passenger planes traveling right now, which means that if you're a flower farmer in Ecuador or Colombia, you're gonna have to search out a freight plane to get those flowers to Miami and get them where they need to go. And that is way more expensive. So you're seeing prices just skyrocket because of the logistical challenge of getting flowers from you know, places like Colombia and Ecuador or Holland into the United States. So there's also like just within the United States, I mean, there's so many problems, right? It's like the, the perfect storm of flower issues. Um, within the United States, we are, I mean, who, who knows this unless you follow this stuff, right? But there's like a trucking crisis in the country. There have never been so few truck drivers and such need for truck driving jobs. So flowers that are being trucked from Miami to Ohio every day are having to wait and wait and wait because there isn't enough truck, truck drivers and trucking to get them where they need to go. The other thing is just the demand is really high right now. So not just from florists doing events because events are finally starting to come back, but for the last year, people have been separated from the people that they love. And one of the ways that they are connecting or showing that they love and miss their loved ones is by sending flowers. And so there has been a huge increase in demand for you know, daily deliveries, special event deliveries. Um, and so I think all of those things together have just put us in the situation that we're in today. Um, and you know, there's other things, there's like peripheral things that are, are big impact, but like we don't talk about them or know about them. Like a lot of the South American um, farms, there's been a lot of consolidation of those farms over the last like, five or 10 years, and that continues to increase. And what's happening is that those consolidated farms and consolidated like companies are mostly selling to grocery stores, which is taking some product off of the market for florists and for floral wholesalers. So that's just like another issue. So put all these things together and we're at the point where supply is really low, prices are really high, demand is really high, and people are starting to freak out. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, I think great, Ellen, that was a beautiful picture you just painted, not beautiful, a very clear <laughs> picture that you just painted for that. And I'd like for Dave to kind of um, talk about how he, cause you know, Dave is, such a master of business and sales through all of his years of experience. Um, and I have some thoughts of what flower farmers might like need to do to kind of step into our role. I see this situation as what we can close the gap between farmers, growers, and the design florist because of this emergency situation, I guess, for a lack of a better word. So Dave, what do you think? What would you say to growers? What are your words of wisdom? Well, one thing I'm going to say is looking back to last March and early April, and when I was working at Glockner, I, we, we had a, when COVID hit hard and everything happened like in two or three days, we had customers call up and cancel their entire orders, canceling a thousand dahlias, canceling, you know, trying to cancel the Lysianthus order, but it was already being delivered to them, you know, canceling a lot of things because they were panicking, they were worried. Some because they had to go to their regular job or they lost their regular job, didn't have the money to support their farming. Um, but my uh, advice to them then was don't cancel your order because even if this goes on, we all thought it was gonna go for a month or two, 
you'll need flowers later in the summer. You're going to wish you had these flowers in August and September when those dahlias are blooming and those lisianthus are blooming because the customers are going to come back. You're going to be busy. Um, it didn't change quite the way as expected. COVID kept happening, but the demand for flowers went through the roof. I don't know of any flower grower that had adapted their way of marketing and selling their flowers that did not have the best year they ever had last year. March might have been the worst month they ever had, but April, May, and June blew it out of the park. I know farmers who that by mid-June had already sold more than they sold the entire year the year before. Um, and I think this year it's going to be even better than that, so to speak, better, because you don't have the as much competition from wholesalers. So the worst thing that a grower could be doing now is cutting back when they're growing and not planning for a 20, 30, or even 40% increase in flower needs this year. If you've got the space to grow it and the way to sell your flowers, um, this is not the year to be cutting back. Uh, but definitely increase by 25, 30, 40% of what you plant for the easy things that you can plant now and still harvest from. It's too late to plant peonies for this year, but you can plant all your annuals, your sunflowers, zinnias, coxcomb, all those plants that you can start now and harvest throughout the summer, start planting those as soon as you can and keep succession planting all summer, increase your production by 20 to 40%, and I'm pretty sure you'll sell it all. Because all it takes is one, looking at florists like Ellen at Local Color, I, I won't ask her how much she spends a year, but it's not in the thousands of dollars, it's in the tens of thousands of dollars. I wouldn't be surprised if it's not $50,000 worth of flowers she spends or more on a normal year. I was gonna say, it, I think it's in the hundreds of thousands yeah, of dollars. So all it takes is one florist like her to discover Oh, here's three local farms I can buy from. The wholesaler doesn't have what I need. I want to buy local this year. And all of a sudden there's, as she said, hundred thousands of dollars in the local flower farm. So can you imagine if just one Ellen came and bought, wanted to start buying from you this year and you were their only option. I mean, you can increase your sales tremendously. So I don't want you to um, get left behind. So plant, especially if you can plant things that are um, affordable and cheap to grow like the sunflowers and coxcomb and filler and things like that, that it's not a big investment. I'm not talking about buying, you know, $5,000 worth of peony plants. I'm talking $500 worth of extra seeds that have the potential to make you an extra $50,000 this year. Because there's gonna be a big void in the wholesale flower market going to retail florist, um, even your local grocery store and to event designers, because like Ellen said, weddings are coming back, that you can step in and help fill that void. And I would also just make one comment that the um, wholesalers that we've heard from are saying that this is not, unfortunately, a very short term problem. Yeah. So, you know, last year, you know, like Dave said, we didn't know what to expect. We thought, OK, we're shut down for a couple of weeks. We're shut down for a month. Right. Everything will get back to normal. These wholesalers are saying foreseeable future years that there could be problems with the supply chain for years yeah. and so this is just the beginning of i think the possibility of a change in the marketplace yeah one way to look at it also is the the growers who didn't plan as much because they thought there was going to be a, a slower season this year you know we're planning stuff last fall um it's, even if they start planting now, just like you, you can't have more flowers ready until another 8, 10, 12 weeks from now. They're doing the same thing on a, on a much bigger scale in Ecuador, in Colombia, in Holland. But then they're still dealing with the transportation issues. They're still dealing with the um, employees not being able to cross the state lines and not being able to have the field full of workers because they have to stay six feet away from each other or alternate work days. So if, if a local farm can grow more stuff, this is the year to do it. If a local farm wanted to increase their business, this is the year to do it for sure. Um, so Ellen and I were talking um, while we were waiting for Dave to come on and for us to all to come on here about, you know, if you sit in either seat, if you're a florist designer or you're a flower farmer, you each have unique problems that are, bubbling up out of this. And one of the things that my personal desire is, is to help our flower farmers, because that y'all are my people, to step up to the line to be able to do this. So let's just think about that for just a minute. Think about flower farmers. I want you to think about the florist designers. These are people that have done contracts perhaps on weddings based on pricing they were giving, on flowers that the bride wanted that they were gonna had ordered that they're now not gonna be able to necessarily maybe get most likely 
at a much higher price for what they can get. They are totally freaking out. And I don't blame them one bit. I mean, I understand their upset. So when they come to the flower farmer, the flower farmer is not going to probably have exactly what they're looking for. The flower farmer is going to think they're being picky. And the florist is going to think, what are these people selling? It's not what I need. We're going to have to all step back and just really take a deep breath and figure this out together because we can do it. And if we can start building on this now, I see, like Ellen just said, I see the wave, the tide is turning and this is it. And when I think about a tide turning, y'all, it takes a heck of emotion to do that. And I think we're in the motion right now. And I think flower farmers have to become professionals. They have to make it easy for the florists to buy from them. That's how Ellen is gonna help us. Um, and so I just wanted to share that, that there is no easy road and everybody's gonna have to do more than you think you should. And you're gonna have to be tolerant and just consider, I told Ellen, I said, it's gonna be like talking to a two and a half year old. You have to repeat yourself over and over because it's just so hard for the other person to understand because they're so, caught up. And that's what we're trying to do here. Um, so Ellen, tell us, and I'm going to look, there's a ton of questions. You tell us what you think some of the unique, the, some of the problems that florists and designers are going to face perhaps, and what your experience and that there's hope we can get through this. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, I think for more conventional florists who are sourcing most of their stuff from a wholesaler, they may be um, forced for the first time or for the first significant time to be looking at substitutions for flowers that they either ordered or imagined that they would be able to get. And buying from a local grower is a totally different process, right? It's a totally different thing. I mean, here in Maryland, if you're looking for, I don't even know, roses, but some kind of rose that you always get from the wholesaler and you promised it to a bride and you come to a farmer and you're like, I need this special rose, like you're going to find out pretty quickly that those don't grow here. Um, but maybe lysianthus is a great substitute. Maybe you don't know what lysianthus is, or maybe you haven't used it before, but maybe that's a good alternative. So I think that florists are going to be forced, whether they want to or not, to be looking at substitutions and how we, how both the florist and the farmer sort of deal with substitutions is going to be key. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest things. The other thing is volume. So if you are an event florist who, you know, is imagining buying 500 stems of something for a big wedding, you're going to be shocked when the farmer says, I have 50 stems of this, or I have 80 stems of this. It's a different thing. It's not the same as going to a wholesaler. Um, but there's, you know, there's things that you can do. There's co-ops available. There's, you know, joint buying, you know, there's lots of things that can happen. It's just, we all have to on the florist side and on the farmer side, I think get creative and, um, think outside of the box a little bit. And I know that that's not comfortable. You know, I don't like, I don't like doing new things all the time. I don't like trying new things all the time. And I certainly don't like to do it when I'm under pressure or when, you know, I know I have a wedding coming up in a month and this is like make or break for me. I got to do this wedding. I got to make it great. Um, I don't like doing new things under those situations, but we're all going to have to, figure out how to work together so that, you know, we can all survive. Our, all of our businesses can survive this. So I have a question for Dave. Unmute yourself, Dave. A couple of your customers are asking if <clears throat> Holland is closed down, are there Dahlia tubers already in this country or are they still in Holland? No, uh, dude. If the order isn't shipping until sometime in late April and May, it's on its way here. I'm pretty sure all the dahlias already left Holland for Edney. Um, it's not so much that kind of problem. Those were already done and harvested last fall. We knew they were good and ready to go. So they're just packing them there and shipping over. That's not so much a problem. Those also come on boats. They don't come on planes. So it's going as the cargo and they don't go through the Suez Canal. So we're safe with that. Um, <laughs> 
Um, so the values are okay as long as you know your order was in and you've got a confirmation that should be fine. Um, so values should be the problem. Looking forward to fall bulbs from right here. There's going to be no excess flower ex excess bulbs, um, but they do. The crop is looking good of what they have, so there shouldn't be any major problems foreseeable for the fall. Hopefully. All right, so before I ask Ellen this question, I want everybody um, to know, and I will try to post a link in the Facebook comments um, for folks, that we have started a new Facebook page that Ellen is the host of, and it's called Florist Buying Local. And it is really filling up, and we it's got some really great conversations going on over there. So we encourage Anyone that is looking to network with other people, um, especially if you're a florist or a designer and you're kind of breaking into this market and you're trying to find your way, that is just a really super great way um, to start. And I'm also going to be posting the link of Ellen and Dave are actually doing a webinar next Wednesday. Is that right? Um on 10, I have to read it, y'all, 10 reasons florists don't buy local. And it Which is- I'd like to change that to 10 reasons florists should buy local. That's the tagline. All right. <laughs> Look at the positive. <laughs> Strategies for farmers and florists to make the process easier. So we all know what that's communicating. And I agree with you, Dave. I'm always trying to put a positive slant on things. Um, so I'll put the link in. That is a Zoom. Um, it'll fill up. There's limited seats, but then after it fills up, you can request the replay um, to get a part of that. So Ellen, Mark has the question, um, how did you find your local growers? I'm starting my flower farm this year, and I want to know how to stick out so people like me can, so people can find him. So any tips um, on finding florists to sell to? Sure. I think um, first and foremost, what I always say is advice to growers who are getting started is to understand who your target market is. So if you are determined to sell to florists, you are going to grow different things than you may grow for a farmer's market if a farmer's market is your number one customer. So florists are going to be, especially event florists. So if you're thinking about wedding florists, event florists, they are going to be interested in, you know, maybe less interested in zinnias and more interested in scabiosa or, you know, nobody at the farmer's market cares about scabiosa, right? It's like teeny tiny thing. Everybody's like, why are you charging $2 a stem for a scabiosa? Florists can't get enough of scabiosa. We literally cannot get enough scabiosa. Um, so you're going to be growing different things. So first, I think always understand who your target market is and be growing things that they want. And that is, you know, so key because when you show up at an event florist and you're like, I have 500 sunflowers and they're like, well, I have a white wedding this weekend. I don't, you know, we're not, we're not together on this. Um, so I would say, know your target market. And then I would start reaching out to event florists and say like, what is it you can't get at the wholesaler? What is it that you really wish you had more of in the local market? What looks kind of bad at the wholesaler that I might be able to grow better locally because it's not being shipped? Um, and then I would say like, try new things. If you have varieties of flowers that you don't see at the wholesaler or that you don't see within the market, that's gonna set you apart. And for me as a florist, I shop with my eyes and mm. I, I want the thing that nobody else has. If you have some weird seed pod, I want it because I know my clients are going to love that weird thing that nobody else has. So that's another way to stand out in the marketplace. So Dave, I'll let you chime in on this one too. Molly is asking, is this the year for new flower farmers to sell their flowers? I'm just going to say, yes, yes. this is every, the every year. year is the year to Take it away, Dave. <laughs> every year is the year for a new flower farmer to sell their flowers. This is just the year. Um, everywhere from if you're selling at a farmer's market, there's a bigger demand because consumers are buying more flowers just because they're home all, all day, all week. Um, 
So you, you'll sell more at a farmer's market. You'll be more apt to find a, your, your people or your flower grower or your flower customers at a farmer's market. If you're selling to a retail florist or an event designer, they're going to need your flowers because the wholesale uh, chain is broken right now. So you definitely is the year to, to sell. Um, my only comment is make sure you grow enough that you have enough to sell. And that means not planting 50 sunflowers a week, but planting 500, not planting 100 lisiathus, but planting 500 or 1,000. Um, plant like you're going to sell it all and then go out and sell it. Nothing's, yeah. worse than sell, nothing's worse than running out of flowers halfway through a farmer's market. We're having a florist call you up and say, I need 100 red dahlias. Well, I only have 10. That doesn't help anybody. And I, um, I know a grower who had... So key what Dave is saying, because yeah. one of the things I hear so much from, from florists who are hesitant to buy local is the number of flowers they can buy, the quantity. Right. quantity. The volume. They are turned off when they hear I have two bunches of something or four bunches of something, right. especially when they need large numbers of things. And if it's a cheap flower to grow, like an annual from seed or sunflower celosia, adjuratum, it's better to have 50 bunches to sell and throw away 30, put them in the compost pile, than to only have three bunches to sell and lose those customers possibly forever. Um, I always like to say Dunkin' Donuts throws away donuts every single day, but their case is always full when you walk in the door and they sell more donuts than anybody else. Flower farming is the same way. You got to have the flowers on the shelf to increase your business and supply the demand that the customers need. And so I always give Dave the credit. If you aren't, what I say is if you aren't throwing 20% of the flowers away that you're growing, you aren't growing enough. Right. You know, because folks are like, it's like, I know say, saying you sell out sounds really cool, but it is not good. It's no. not a good business practice at all. That so was a couple one of thing I took away from Joe Schmidt's podcast, the No-Till Flowers podcast with Jenny. That was the one big takeaway. I thought, okay, he really pounded away. Bring, st take stuff home. Don't ever sell yeah. out. Always have more than yeah. you need. And I think it's hard. I think people kind of feel like a loser at first, because they don't understand that. That is called shrinkage. You're supposed to throw that away or compost it. Um, so I want to say first, our friend Mima is listening in on us here. And Mima. Um, Mima says, don't cancel orders, order more. And yes. I couldn't be more um, in agreement with that. So Stephanie is asking, and then I'm going to jump over to Zoom. We have some questions over there. How can flower farmers best communicate what is currently in bloom to florist, or I guess what's available to their florist? Well, um, I, the standard I would say is some sort of availability list, like a weekly availability list that you send out to your email list. And somebody asked the other day, um, you know, what format is the best format? And for me, I don't care, like this is just me personally, I don't care what format it is as long as it has all of the pertinent information on there. So you need to have the name of the flower. You need to have a clear picture of the flower that shows what it really looks like. You need to have the stem length. You need to have the price. You need to, for me, I want to know how many of these you have available. If I want to order 200 and there's no way for me to know how many you have and you have 20, well, that doesn't help me. Um, so as long as you have the pertinent information on there, whether it's Google Sheets or it's Airtable or it's, you know, um, Shopify or it's, you know, some custom thing you have, it doesn't, that doesn't really matter as long as you have the pertinent information on there. Yeah, I like to always recommend people use MailChimp. It's, there's yeah. free. If you have under a thousand emails on your list, which I can guarantee you, you're not going to be selling to a thousand florists. So it's very easy to do. And what you do is just every week, you same, use the same one you used last week, copy it, delete the things that are sold that are no longer in production and add your new ones, hit send, and it goes out. The important thing I would recommend, and Ellen will agree with with me on this, that availability list needs to go out every week at the same time, whether it's Saturday morning at eight, Monday night at five, the same time every week, because your florist will know they probably have an alarm on their phone to check the Joe's flowers list comes out in 10 minutes. I got to be first in line and see what's there and, and get my order in. And especially with competition for your flowers increasing, you want to mm -hmm. make sure that you're not, um, 
making people angry by not sending it at the same time on the same day, because what they're going to say is, well, I didn't know when you were going to send it. So I wasn't able to get in on the good flowers before they were all gone. So even playing field for everybody, send it out at the same time, same day, every single week. And you make your deliveries the same time every week. Yeah, people have to, first off, that just is your show of being a pro, in my opinion. You're reliable. They can count on you no matter what is happening. So I have a couple questions over here on Zoom. Um, Somebody's asking, what about all the seed shortages and time it takes to get the seeds from suppliers? Well, I, we haven't really experienced much of a seed shortage. I mean, wouldn't you say, Dave, in flat and vet- Except for uh, eucalyptus. Eucalyptus Very- is non-existent this year. Other than that, right. the seed's available. There's a couple of Benary giant zinnias that ball won't have again until the fall. They're just sold out. But for the most part, ball has plenty of seeds. They ship out orders in a day or two. Um, some other seed companies are really backed up in shipping. Again, it's their business has exploded, gone through the roof, you know, expanded unbelievably this year. Some of them are COVID restricted. They can't have as many people in the office. They may not be have a big enough building to do the work. So they're just backlogged in shipping. Drive um, across state lines. Like there's all kinds yeah. of weird, you know, restrictions, yeah. travel restrictions. Yes. And then also the I know like with Ball, their website will show you if, if you're trying to order certain sunflower and it's not in stock, it'll show the date they expect it. And that's usually pretty accurate. So you can see, okay, they're gonna be here in a week. I'll go ahead and place the order. But if they're not gonna be until June 15th, that's too late for me, I'll pick another variety. Um, but all the seed companies, you know, I don't want to name other ones, but the other seed companies are backed up in shipping. They're just overwhelmed. It's that simple. No other way to put it. Yeah. And I mean, that's, we find that in a lot of our suppliers. And if they have a COVID outbreak in their company, yeah. it sinks they shut down and for two that's weeks. what's really, so, I yeah. mean, I understand the frustration. Um, and I can t- I tell you, cause I buy a lot of seeds from ball and what Dave says, it's a little tough figuring out how to read and the because it, it's not quite as friendly as some of the apps that we're used to using right. but once you figure it out you get so you can see exactly when your stuff is going to come um, it's really really a great platform so what are the most needed flowers that florists wished farmers would grow more of that's a great question you're muted Ellen. oh you're muted Ellen. Sorry. there you go For me, this gets back to what kind of florist are you selling to? Yes. Are you selling to a retail florist that is doing FTD orders through the wire service? Those florists are going to need a totally different type of flower than an independent designer who is doing small weddings, you know, in an urban area. I don't know. It really depends so much on the type of florist that you're selling to. Um, it's hard to just pick a flower. Um, it really, it really depends on who you're selling to. And I even know with the good answer for you, but I, it it really depends. And even with the event florist, they like Ellen said before, they have a pink and white wedding this week. Next week is yellow and red. It changes every week, so we can't say grow lots of red flowers, grow lots of pink, or lots of burgundy. Um, you got to grow a wide assortment and you know grow enough of each that you can supply. It. Back to this the supply amount to grow. I know grower has a, a lot of dahlias and he had some in caught and wanted to order 1000 cafe au lait dahlias at $5 a stem. He didn't have it. He had to turn down the order and he will never not grow a thousand <laughs> cafe au lait plants a year again because he that $5,000 sale he lost because he only had 150 cafe au lait plants. So you got to be prepared for those big orders. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm doing this over on Facebook and I will do the same thing in Zoom and just <clears throat> actually in the Zoom people are all our custom or all of our newsletter list. So you guys will have access to what I'm posting over here. I just want to say a few things. Let me get this last one posted. All right, so I just posted in the Facebook comments two things. The link to request to attend Ellen and Dave's the top 10 reasons florists don't buy local. 
um, which is next Wednesday. And it will be recorded. And once it's full, we will then be able to send, if you're signed up, um, we'll send you the link to watch the replay. And the other bit of news, and I don't even think Dave knows this, um, you have to know that so much has happened for everybody in this industry in the last week. Um, and so this all started when Ellen contacted us. And the, after we thought about it for a little while, Ellen suggested, um, why don't we run my online course, a special, not a special edition, a special run. Right. And that means that um, for those of you, Ellen, tell us what the name of your course is. Sure. The course is called Growing Your Business with Local Flower Sourcing. And yeah. it really is um, a nuts and bolts approach to how to source locally successfully. And so this was a new online course that we published for her just this last year, and it ran this January. And it's like, it her students are now really kind of one step above because they've kind of been through the course. So um, I did just post the link directly to her page on our website. We are going to run the course again, and it's going to be very, the course isn't changing, but the way that we give it to you is changing. We are trying to provide a way to help florists and designers who need to figure out how to source and have help doing it. I mean, real concrete help. Um, we are going to run the class. So I just shared the link. The registration or the enrollment is going to be April 19th through the 23rd. It's only open for five days. And I just want to take a minute to tell you, so normally it would be dripped out to you over six weeks. Well, we're not doing that. When you make the purchase um, during that enrollment period, the entire course is going to be put into your library. But Ellen is preparing bonus sessions, which her past students will also have access to, that it's going to be kind of like the roadmap the meat of how the cliff notes to the course so that florists and designers can enroll in the course and not have to sit down and watch 16 hours of videos while they're pulling their hair out. There she is gonna, we're gonna give you the roadmap to figure it out. So the link's in the Facebook feed and um, we're really excited. It has thrown my staff into <laughs> overdrive. <laughs> <laughs> we have spent all day doing crazy things, trying to get ready for this because Ellen has a servant's heart, just like I do that we, and Dave, that we just really want to help people. We want to share and we've created this tool and we just feel like this is kind of a given. It's just kind of a natural progression. It feels like to me to do this. And There's I think gonna... like one of the great things about offering it now is Besides the class, we have the live Q and A. Right. And so every right. week for I think we decided eight weeks now, um, we're going to do a live Q and A once a week. So this is really like an, a, a live coaching session. So it, it's interesting because I was saying today, um, you know, our winter class it was sort of all in theory because you're like, okay, well it's winter. I'm not ready. I'm not going to be doing this until April or May. This is January, but now we're in it, right? We're like in the moment where you are like, okay, I'm going to like call a farmer today. Like I need some help on what to say, or I have to make this delivery. And how do I do it? Like we're, we're in real time sort of coaching people um, on how sourcing locally works. So to me, it's like really exciting because it's, it's sort of live, live coaching as you're doing it. And you know, it's so funny, Dave, isn't it? Because that's why we moved Dave's class, which used to be during the winter. Now it's kind of at an inconvenient time for some growers. It runs now, his class is on bulbs, woodies and perennials and more. It's like how to expand your offering. And so now we run it, it registers in June and it is in July and August. The exact time people are buying and picking out and planting, starting to plant and make plans. So it's just so funny. I didn't even realize that until you started saying it, Ellen. That's what we did with Dave's class last year. We moved it so that the students would have access to Dave while they're doing it. 
You know, you don't think of those questions while you're in school, but when you're staring at a catalog or looking online to be able to have that weekly interaction. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to bring everybody up to speed on that. That's kind of a, a breaking news, last minute thing. Um, something Grace is on here too. And she had a suggestion, which I think is a really great suggestion, especially for new growers, is she says, I think new growers should plan to do some work. For example, go see what is being sold at the wholesaler to see what the standards are like quality, stem length, vigor, bud size, how they're packaged, all that kind of stuff. And that's just really a great tip. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about in my courses that just like Ellen, you need an account with the wholesaler because you need to buy hard goods from them. You may not realize it yet, but you need to have a backup to buy, whether it's flower food or vases or whatever to be that. And then that gets you in the door. That means you can go down there and look, right? And I mean, don't you think that's beneficial? Totally. I mean, I think the more growers understand a, what the wholesalers are selling. So, you know, what people expect, but also how they can, frankly, provide a better product, you know, so they understand, okay, well, you know, the Snapdragons looked great, but, you know, there were Cosmos in there that looked really terrible. Maybe Cosmos don't right. ship very well. So maybe I'm going to like really concentrate on those things that looked real, not that great at the wholesaler. So yeah, for sure. The more information gathering you can do to make yourself stand out, the better. Yeah. And I see our friend Janice is on here too, our Canadian uh, farmer. Hi, Janice. And I know. So coffee out of her coffee cup this week. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I see our friend Donna, who is the flower growers of Mississippi, um, she's oh. asking, is there much success related to co-op groups? And funny, you oh. should ask that, yes. Donna, because Dave and I just today, or actually I did mine today, Dave did his, I can't believe you did it before me. We were asked to write letters oh. for a co-op that's developing in Richmond, Virginia. Um, they're applying for a grant. And um, I think, co we cannot go deep in this, y'all, but I think that co-ops are the future Right. Local grower co-ops are the yeah. future of the flower business. Even if it's only three or four farms or 10 or 15 farms, uh, speak, I'll speak for Ellen. It's so much easier to buy from one big availability list from four or five or 10 farmers all in one. You place your order, it all comes together, than to look at 10 different availability lists or even just three availability lists. So if you can combine with even two or three other farmers, you'll see a, a big change in the way you're retail florists and floral designers buy from you. They'll buy more because it's easier for them. Especially from those florists who are used to buying from a wholesaler. Yes. Who are totally turned off by the idea of having to go to 10 different farmers for 10 different things. The idea of going to a co-op where there's three farmers, five farmers, there's a new co-op in Northern Virginia that has 22 farmers. That's basically wow. a wholesaler. I mean, you're basically buying from, you know, a wholesale group. And so the more that those kind of groups exist and can make it easy for florists to buy, the more they're going to buy local. And, you know, it just occurred to me. Um, so Donna, who has, um, she, uh, Donna, I'm sorry, I don't remember. She, I think, works through the university. They have a lot of resources. Um, that would be an incredible thing for them to do. Is there, it just dawned on me, is there a list of co-ops in this country? I Maybe don't think we need so. to, I think we need to create that, Ellen, and put it in that Facebook group. Maybe Suzanne and Kelly can help us make a file and maybe other people can contribute of other co-ops that are up and working. That would be a really great. I um, think that's a great idea. And there's more and more, um, you know, we have one in Maryland, there's one in Northern Virginia, just the idea that I have access to two whole, you know, two co-ops within, you know, a 60 mile range of us is amazing. Yeah, it yeah. is. I see a lot of questions on here about pricing. Pricing is always the, you know, million dollar question. And that's not something we can really go into, but I will tell you that, um, in Ellen's Facebook group, where you network with other people, that's something you can talk to other professionals in the group and with Ellen. But 
that is part of what Ellen talks about in her course. I talk about in my course, Dave talks about, I mean, it's more than just saying, this is how much you should charge for this pen. It depends on what you're selling, where you are, what market you're selling. And it's just not that simple y'all. Right. So right. for us to answer that is so misleading. Um, and of course the ASCFG has a baseline price list that you can jump off with. Um, but I see, and I understand that pricing is the scariest thing of right. selling. Well, um, in my seminar I did last week, somebody asked, they were talking about selling at a farmer's market. She said, should she try and undersell the competition at the market? And my first answer, I said, no, 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 no. You're not going for the lowest price. You're going for the best value and the best flowers. So very, very true. Um, so I'm just reading through here. Um, I'm going to go look on the chat box. It looks like there's some on the Zoom Q&A. Yeah, there's some in both places. So when we've answered this one, we answered, did we, we did what, what are the flowers needed? What flowers do florists want them to grow more of? We answered that. Mm -hmm. We can't answer about pricing. We kind of just address that. Um, while they won't, here's one from Marsha, while they won't be available this year, should I be starting from seed and planting perennials? Um, does Ellen see designers moving towards more unusual cut flowers? I think they're all, you are all drawn yeah. to unusual, aren't you? And there's tons of perennials that you should be growing. Things like obviously peonies, but phlox, yarrow, all of those sell great. And they just, you know, have their, their blooming window. You might only have two or three or four weeks of those flowers, but definitely you should be growing perennials. Yeah. And that's what Dave's class is all about. And that starts in June. Um, the registration does. Anne is asking, um, oh, and look, um, we have somebody here from the Michigan Flower Growers Cooperative. Um, so we need to put them on our list. So um, Anne is asking, is it better for a new flower farmer to grow a high quantity of several flowers per season rather than growing lots of different flowers, but of smaller quantity until they figure out their best client? So, you know, that's, I feel like I'll let you answer that. Age old question. This yeah. is like, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I feel like we have, and maybe Dave can answer this better. We have farmers like Maya Kosick of Hill and Homestead who grows, you know, in small quantities, but she grows crazy varieties of things, varieties we've never mm -hmm. seen that we always are excited because there are things that are so unique and setting us apart. And we have growers that are like, look, I grow these 20 crops and you can get 500 stems of them from me. And that's all I'm gonna do. And for us, we need both. We need both of those kinds of farmers. Right. And I think you have to find what fits you, right, Dave? And how much space you have and, you know, I mean- And what you'd like to do. Some people yeah. don't wanna grow. Yeah. <laughs> 50 different things. They, they want to stick to five or 10. They can do really well and sell a hundred bunches of those a week through their co-op or to their local group of florists. It all is what you want to do. Right. Both, both so, models work. Mm -hmm. um, so Julie is asking if we can add a map to the Facebook page. I don't have any idea about that, but we'll, <laughs> we'll we will talk to the powers above us, which are the young people that run the IT in my <laughs> company. Yeah. Um, is there a market for dry flowers that I couldn't sell last year? You want to hit what we talked about that the other day with somebody, didn't we, um, yeah. Ellen? Yeah, dried flowers. I think there is a market for dried. Um, but I think as a grower, um, you have to be careful about how you're pricing dried flowers because, you know, there's a perception that dried is cheaper or that it's, you know, dead so it should not be as much as a fresh <laughs> right. cut flower um but what you have to realize is you know you have taken a fresh flower and you have added work to it right so you have to store it you have to dry it you have to preserve it you have to keep it somewhere you know for us like we don't have room to keep stuff um when it's dried like we have a limited amount of space and we can keep a limited amount of stuff but so all of that adds cost to the stem. So now if you're selling a, a single stem of dried sunflower, which you could sell fresh for $2, you might have to sell for $3 dried or $4 dried. And then people are right. like, talking about $4 no. dried flower. I wouldn't recommend growing flour specifically to dry. You dry your excess and your leftovers that are dryable. 
That's what yeah, it's just extra steps is kind of what Ellen and I came to the other day. So let's see, business question. I'm starting a flower farm. Do you recommend I license my business as a sole proprietor if I sell primary to floors? That is a question that you need to come to a conclusion with your CPA and then through an attorney. Um, nobody, every situation is unique. It depends Different. on where your, what your tax status is. And, and what, your, what your risk is. If you own a bunch of property, you don't want to lose on a lawsuit. Yep. You don't want to sole proprietor. <clears throat> I'm only selling on my porch farm stand and posting in local Facebook groups as this is my first season. But to be honest, I'm also afraid to do anything else like to sell to florists. How does a newbie get over this? Practice, 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 and jumping. Yeah. Yes. Know? I mean, I tell the story so many times about my husband having to like literally on the phone talking me down to the first florist shop. I was so terrified that they'd look at my flowers and say, why would we want your old garden flowers? That's what I thought they were going to say. Instead, they bought them all. Yeah. Well, I think it's important though, is if it's your first year, don't approach florists to sell to them unless you have the quantity to sell to them. Don't right. show up with the one bucket of flowers. And that's all you have available that week. You have to have volume. And so I would I've say that there's a, there's, more and more, I think there could be a strategy where a new grower connects with a new designer. So, you know, somebody who's in their first or second year of growing and somebody who's doing, you know, small weddings or elopements out of their house. So you're both sort of at the same stage Experience. of business. You're both able to grow together. You might be a little more, um, accepting of each other's um, newness and try to find somebody that you can grow together with rather than saying, I'm a first year grower. I'm going to go to this, you know, 25 year old um, in, you know, been in business 25 year florist and say, oh, I've got some flowers for you. Maybe start on like the same level you're on at that point. So I didn't see Mima's um, comment, but somebody has just highlighted it to me. Um, so Mima's statement or question was about how important it is that correct pricing be demonstrated on flowers that we're selling um, to growers so we don't undervalue them. Um, you may think it's going to help you sell your flowers, but it's going to put you out of business and it undercuts everybody else. It's not good. It's not good for the overall market. So while we can't really go into pricing, we can say this. You will not be here, a part of us, after you undercut, because there's a reason the prices are what they are. You have to pay the bills. You have to have some profit. That's the point of being in business. Um, and we all, everybody everywhere has one person that shows up to market selling low dollar bouquets or comes into the florist after you and undercuts you. Um, but it what goes around comes around, but it's yeah. hard to suffer through it. Don't you be that person. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because you do not. Yeah, you really do not want to be that person. All right. I'm still I'm looking for. Um, for the email to florist designers, it's best to list everything in the email and not a link to somewhere with the info. Correct. So you want an at a glance list, right? That's what right. she's asking about. Is that. Yeah. So I want to just say again that Dave and Ellen are doing a webinar next Wednesday. 10 reasons florists don't buy local, strategies for farmers and florists to make the process easier. Just another way to kind of give us a step to embrace this. And, um, you know, we know that there's people facing really tough situations. I read in two different places on social media today, really bad situations that farmers delivered to a florist and they were kind of like already losing their mind the florist because yeah. they weren't getting, you know, they have a wedding this weekend and they do not have the flowers that they need. And so I just want everybody to kind of remember we're all in this boat together and we all have to bail it out and to not <clears throat> each other. We need to bond and close that gap. Um, and so I want to say something that Maya, I, I had a meeting with Maya today, one of our farmers, and we were talking about these issues and she said, now is the time that we need a kind and resilient supply chain. And yes. that just really struck me because yeah. we're all struggling. Everybody is in like a weird situation trying to keep their businesses going. And 
you know, we want to be here for the long term and we want to, you know, I think show each other some, some kindness in the, in the process. Yes. I'm just scrolling through here. We just had, there's so many great questions. So a really great place for us to have these discussions is in that new Facebook group that Ellen is hosting. And it is called, you can search Facebook and find it florist buy and local. And you have to request it's closed in there. So we can talk about stuff that customers aren't going to see um, and just really encourage you to get over there and get in. And um, maybe Ellen and Dave and I will do some Facebook lives in there. I mean, that's, it just gives us the opportunity to do what we're doing, but not in a very public um, way because this is business, right? If you're interested in Ellen's course, I would highly recommend that you sign up to get on our wait list um, where we hope it doesn't happen, but we just because there's going to be so much interaction, we may limit the number of students this time. Um, we've never done that before, but this is really an unprecedented time with a lot of high emotion and chatter. So um, anyway, we'd love for you other, to join us for that. And I'm really good with high emotion and chatter. Right. <laughs> One other quick thing I want to throw out there, just about the supply chain in general for cut flowers, is that some of the California growers that have been there for years, the big, huge mega growers, have switched over to cannabis. Uh, so they literally stopped growing flowers. There was one who had an order for a 1.3 million Snapdragon plugs, already planted, already ordered. They canceled the order. They paid for it, but they canceled the order. And they were Snapdragons geared for the Mother's Day harvest period. So 1.3 million Snapdragons dropped out of the supply chain for Mother's Day this Mother's Day. So that's the kind of thing that's happening. Not only COVID related, this is totally unrelated to it. Another, you know, stone thrown under the wheel or whatever for the flower supply chain, the wholesale chain, a grower like that just cutting out flowers. And that's just the snapdragons they stopped. I don't know what else that they grew, that they just stopped growing it. Wow. And so I know the thing that I wanted to say was, especially to the flower farmers, the people here that are growing and selling, to encourage them to join that Facebook group. We are going to help. We want to help the florists <laughs> figure out how to work with us. You know what I mean? We want to come together to the, everybody come to the table. So it'd be a really great for your florist to join into that group as well as Ellen's course, y'all. I mean, it just really is the roadmap on how to make this easier. And um, it's just really, I mean, I can't even tell you the wheels that have begun to turn because we're now doing this, what, six months early. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, y'all, we thank everybody for joining us. We've had quite a crowd here. Um, my plan is to turn this into a podcast so people can listen and share it, um, not just have it on Facebook. And um, so without any further ado, I'm just looking to see if any of my staff- Yes, the name of Ellen's course again. Ellen, name your course. Sure, it's called Growing Your Business with Local Flower Sourcing. And um, I- have to say it's pretty good pretty good yes <laughs> um, and you can find all of the gardeners workshop courses on the gardeners workshop.com yep right and um so guys we really hope to see you over on the facebook group and be sure to sign up for their webinar next week but if you miss out on a live seat um then you would just automatically get the replay but you have to sign up for it so guys we really appreciate you being here and um we'll get through this let's close the gap yep ciao Sounds good good night everybody thank you good night <laughs>